Welcome to Truth Speakers, a Burning Lights Ministries podcast. I am Katie Bowers, full-time mom and full-time evangelist. I'm here to encourage you to be and train the next generation of truth speakers. Be sure to subscribe, like, and share, and follow us on all of our social media platforms. Good morning, Truth Speakers family. Welcome back to Truth Speakers. I am so excited about today. I feel like I should put that like on a t-shirt or something because I think I say that every single episode. I'm so excited. (laughs) Let me know. Anyway, I may have had way too much coffee this morning. I had to wake up super early, but you know, that's all right. We're just going to we're just going to do be high energy today. All right. So um, which is probably good because I'm going to be talking about a subject that might be offensive. I don't know yet. I guess we'll see. I've been getting a lot of hate messages here lately, so at this point, I don't really care. (laughs) Um, So here's the thing. Um, I am looking around and listening to a lot of different things right now, and I'm hearing a lot of different parenting advice, but I don't feel like I'm hearing enough of the parenting advice that I read in the Bible. I think I'm 28, so I am the last, I think I'm like the last year of the millennial generation, what we call millennials. Um, And what I see a lot in the millennials, and then I think it has progressively gotten worse ever since then, is um, like, Just, like, people thinking they're experts about everything. I think we can thank the internet for that. Everybody thinks that because they can Google something or uh, read it on Wikipedia that they are all of a sudden a college graduate (laughs) Uh, when that is not the case. Uh, And I see a lot of young moms being like, oh, yeah, I know everything about everything what there is about whether I don't have to learn anything else. I'm the perfect mom now. Well, I think that is a a very delusional way of thinking because I don't think any of us know anything about what we're doing. The only person who knows the way is Jesus. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So I think the only uh, way we can truly know how to be the best parent and how to be the best Christian, how to be the best minister, how to be the best version of ourselves is simply by um, hearing what God has to say. And then listening to elders. I feel like that's also an issue right now in my generation because we have Google. We don't feel like we need, you know, mom and dad, pastors, uh, elders opinion whenever the Bible instructs us that the elder should teach the younger. Now, I do understand that elders and people in leadership are are still people, so they're not going to be perfect. But he also said, in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. So uh, we have tried to apply this to our life, uh, where we don't just have one person that we look to. We don't just, we don't just do Google. We don't just do, um, um, our pastor. We don't just do our parents. We don't just do some of the elders um, of the faith around us, but we use them all. We utilize them all. Google is definitely on the bottom of the list. I, we avoid that if possible because, you know, Google's going to tell you you have cancer first first try, first go around. You know, either you got cancer or you're pregnant. That's exactly Google's go-to if you're a woman. Okay, so Um, I want to be sure that I am pulling from the right sources. There's safety in a multitude of different counselors, sources. So I don't want to be high-minded and decide that I uh, know better, I know a lot. So let's just start off this this podcast by saying, let's approach um, life in a spirit of humility, not with the spirit of pride, believing that we know everything, uh, believing that we um, know exactly how to be the perfect parent, uh, because none of this stuff is black and white. Even Really, even in the Bible, um, it doesn't give you specific advice 
on a lot of things. It gives us general advice, general uh, instruction, but not all the time does it say, you know, this is what you do if you have a strong-willed child that refuses to potty train, <laughs> right? It's it's not going to be that specific in the moment, but along with the uh, general instruction that we can receive from the Bible, along with uh, receiving and drawing from the wills of our elders, along with a personal relationship with Jesus where you can talk with him in prayer and he can talk back to you. Awesome. Okay. So here's where it's going to get a little bit rocky. All right. Everybody lay your hand on your heart right where you are. Okay. And now I want you to repeat after me. I promise I will still love Katie after this podcast. (laughs) Okay, now that we have that over with and it's all established, I'm thankful that we can still be besties after this podcast. Okay, so here's an issue that I'm seeing a lot. And here's an issue that I've had to work on myself. Okay, you know me. I'm always transparent. I'm always going to talk about things that I deal with myself and where God is, has me right now, where he's dealing with me right now. And then I'll probably relate it to things that maybe I'm not doing. Okay. So I've been convicted and here's what I've been convicted over. First of all, let, first of all, let me say many of you have heard me preach for years. Uh, I said this literally when I was 18 preaching, Katie Bowers is not, nor will she ever be a feminist. I believe the feminist movement is straight out of the pits of hell. It goes against the spirit of the word. It goes against the original intent for mankind and womankind. It um, masculinizes women and uh, feminizes, feminizes, whatever that word is, uh, men. It, it tries to reverse the role, this this whole idea of what they call equality. And I, I know they use all these nice words that make you feel like um, it's, it's things like equal opportunity. But what they're trying to do is make men and women the same thing, which is the reason why we feel like the feminist movement should be going against the... Um, um, uh, the what do you call it the the homosexual agenda uh, that is being pushed right now uh, that's why we have young men in a girls locker room right and women in a, in, uh, and 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 going into women's restrooms okay and this is why we have uh, our young women in danger in restrooms and in locker rooms okay so why aren't the feminists? fighting this because aren't they all about uh the protecting women right aren't they all about protecting their rights and protecting them from being violated they aren't because their agenda and the spirit of what they're doing uh encourages men acting like women and women acting like men and let me just tell you let me just tell you right now I don't want to be a man. <laughs> I, I, I see that they are trying to, and I really do believe there is good hearted people out there that are, are feminists and that, um, you know, really believe in their cause. Um, but they just don't realize what they're really doing because they feel like they are empowering women. But what they are really doing is putting us in danger. And not only that, but by making us more masculine or more manly, they are robbing us of our greatest strengths. They are robbing us of our fullest potential, the fullness of success in a woman's life, because I don't know a single biological man that can uh, carry a baby, give birth to a baby, and and I, I, I believe it's an undeniable fact that women naturally have something in them. Um, I, I, I know people call it a mother's intuition, but it really is something given by God uh, to be able to uh, um, uh, a mother a child 
a, a, a woman naturally has a more nurturing part of her uh, um, nature, um, and and it just is, is a balance. They they need both a mother and a father in their life. I do believe that that's the plan of God. If you don't have that, I am not in any way um, um, speaking ill of you. I believe we have to work with where we're at. We have to um, do the best with the situation, deal the cards we've been handed. Okay, so please don't feel like you're being attacked, but you have, no one can deny that the original intent and plan of God uh, for family was for, um, in the love of a mother and a father relationship, a child is conceived and both raise the child up um, together uh, and uh, in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Okay, so in the spirit of feminism where it has tried to rob the women of their fullest potential here's what i see has happened because i didn't realize that this mentality was in me because like i told you i have been the one from day one saying i am not nor will i ever be a feminist but i was raised I was born in 96, okay? So I was raised in the generation of um, girl power, right? Uh, uh, Girl boss, right? So what I did not realize in my mind was uh, there was a part of me that I have denied for years, but it took uh, some friction and some tension in my life to reveal it. Aren't you thankful God does that to us? I am. And what I realized was there was something ingrained in me, I believe from the culture, not from my parents. My, my parents have displayed a beautiful picture of what a godly husband and wife relationship looks like. They have never been anything but excellent examples to me and my sister and anyone around them. Uh, but what, what I found was I, without realizing it, had this idea in my mind that me and my husband were supposed to have equal responsibility. Now, okay, I know what a lot of you are thinking, and it is, yeah, that's exactly right, because our grandparents' generation kind of swung way too far in the opposite way, right? The, the man went to work great. I agree with that. Then the man came home and the wife was a servant. Okay. So I'm not about that. And, uh, I, I, I don't believe that the Bible is about that. It teaches us that, uh, the man should love the wife, which I believe there was so much to that. Uh, it goes down into when the husband recognizes the wife is at the wit- at her wits end, uh, and that love, he does things to relieve the pressure, right? Uh, and, 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 and wives, uh, submit yourselves to your husband. Uh, you know, so I, I see that that idea, uh, in the past and generations past has um, seemingly enslaved women and it has swung too far the other way. But I think right now, instead of finding the correct biblical God minded middle ground there, we have found a way too far the other way um, of thinking. Here I was thinking I just had this perfect marriage because I think my husband's awesome. And, but I didn't realize that I was, I was the one that was producing an unnecessary chaos in my life because I believed that, okay, because I have this career and I know some of you are like a career, the ministry is our career. It is our business that we have started. I know a lot of people don't like that way of thinking, but just to kind of put you in the right mindset of what our life looks like, um, it looks like we both have high power jobs, um, a career that is uh, stressful. It's demanding. It's physically demanding. It's mentally and spiritually demanding. And then now we have um, our children, uh, with us at all times. Uh, we're not really the kind of people that likes to leave our kids with other people. Um, we, we believe that God has given us these children, uh, to raise and to disciple, to be the next generation of truth speakers, which is hence the name of this podcast. I decided 
that our strengths were the same. And I'll tell you why I think that is wrong. I am naturally a more organized person than Elijah. I would say um, he is a one track mind and he is dead set to finish and accomplish what he is in the middle of doing. And um, and that means that unfortunately, at times, everything in between point A to point B kind of falls off the wagon. And so this at times was a point of contention in our marriage. And I thought, well, I'm able to do this. I'm, I'm able to uh, multitask. I'm able to do that, you know, and, and it would irritate me at times. He did not realize the amount of times a baby's diaper needs to be changed. Simple, right? To me, this is common knowledge. To me, this is something obvious. But this wasn't something that was in his mind. He's not wired to think that way. So it is an unfair expectation for me to want Elijah to think like a mother. It is unfair for him to expect me to think like a dad because here I am seeing all the little needs of our children and thinking this, if I purchase this, uh, homeschool material, if I, if I, uh, purchase this, I'm not acknowledging, okay, he as the provider has a weight on his shoulders of, uh, you know, providing for his family. And so whenever here I come adding all these little expenses and all these things that I deem necessary, uh, okay, what about the grocery bill? What about, are we going to have enough money to provide for groceries? So he could very well in the same way, without a communication happening there, expect me to think like a man. And, and uh, let me just say, I'm thankful I'm not a man. You know how many times my husband has had to deal with the sewer with our camper? I don't want to deal with sewer. I, I, I don't know how to wire up an electric pole. I, I don't know how to, you know, I don't even know how to run the hose from our camper to the will, the well house, right? So I, I, I don't have strengths that he has, but he don't have strengths that I have. And so this whole mindset of uh, us being the same, it is simply not right. And all this does is produce chaos in our lives. So first of all, I just want to tear down this mindset of men and women have the same strengths. Anything, you know, our generation, anything boys can do, girls can do better. I think that is totally, um, for in the first place, disrespectful to men, uh, to believe that women are better than men. Uh, how in that way is, is equality? How, how in that way is that respect of gender? It, it goes against the whole mindset. I think, matter of fact, I think it's quite hypocritical uh, for that to even part of the be part of the mindset. So let's talk about the biblical perspective of a woman's role. And um, I know some of you are going to get annoyed whenever you figure out where I'm going to read from, because I think you already know, um, because quite frankly, I've been the person who's been like, oh my gosh, another women's conference about this subject. Please just move on, find something else to talk about. But like I told you, I want to talk about what God's dealing with me about. So Proverbs 31. Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> I know, I know what you're thinking, but please just give me, give me a chance. Okay. Proverbs 31, verse 15, speaks of a virtuous woman. And it says, she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. All right. Now, something very interesting about this. If you look up in the Strong's concordance the definition of the word night it says she rises while well, it is still yet night I've always thought that that meant um, that it was you know so early the sun, sun hadn't gotten up yet well I, I'm not totally eliminating that um, but I think this thought is just so cool because it is so relevant to so many moms including myself now if you look up that word night in the Strong's, it says, 
a twist away from the light. Figuratively, adversity. A midnight season. How many times have you been sicker than a dog? And of course, in your house, you're not the only one sick. So while you're sick, while you're in pain or you're suffering or nauseous or struggling to breathe, whatever kind of sickness it was, you hear a baby cry or you hear uh, a child sick in the other room and you peel yourself up off the bed and you go in and you take care of them regardless of your feelings. That right there, that is such a special, special gift that a mother has within her. That driving force that forces us to go beyond our feeling, to go beyond um, our, our idea of what my rest should look like, and stepping into love that demands us to do something. Okay, so this leads me to my first point. Um, and please don't get offended at me. I am so afraid some of you guys are going to get mad at me over this podcast, but I hope you just hear my heart. So something a friend of mine told me, um, she works in the, um, uh, labor and delivery part of the hospital. She's very good at her job. She's a uh, labor and delivery nurse. Uh, she So she delivers babies all the time. And uh, we live in a part of the country uh, where there is a large um, Hispanic population. And, you know, part of the culture um, of, of, of them is... Um, they have lots of babies. It's a very Catholic-minded uh, mindset, and uh, uh, devout Catholics believe don't believe in birth control. So they have lots and lots of kids. And what she told me was, the white girls like me that would come in to have a baby, they would come in whining like babies, you know, being pitiful, uh, not having any pride about themselves, not having any modesty, you know, uh, just acting like a baby, acting like a fool, not having any integrity about them at all, and crying for mama, begging for an epidural. But she said something she noticed about the little Hispanic girls that would be there was they would just come in with a mind made up, they're going to come in and get this job done. They didn't come in acting like babies. They didn't come in, you know, saying, uh, you know, uh, woe is me. Uh, I can't believe I have to do this. Get me out of this. But they came in, womaned up, did the job, if you can say that, and simply delivered a baby with a lot fewer problems. So, something that my generation I think has ingrained in us because of different options okay so my generation was the generation of Tylenol moms it was at our it we over-the-counter medicine we were able to access it anytime we had a headache Tylenol anytime we had a belly ache uh, you know, what was that stuff called? Pepto-Bismol. Oh, ugh, I can never stomach that stuff. You know, anytime we had anything wrong with us, it was no longer like a home remedy type of thing of our grandparents' generation. But we had medicine at our fingertips. If we had something wrong, we had access to a doctor to prescribe us a medicine. And then whenever we were old enough, you know, even our parents' generation um, to have children, now we have this option of an epidural, which please don't get me wrong. With my first baby, I got an epidural. I was put into total shock at the amount of pain we're supposed to go through to have children. And it terrified me when I started to feel that pain and although I had went in with the mindset that I ain't gonna take no epidural I got the epidural when the doctor looked at me and said honey you're gonna be doing this for two days and I said okay I went out of this pain but this whole this whole cultural mindset of you have pain oh I have a pill for that I have a remedy for that 
And, but that when my friend told me that about the women, it just showed me that if you see this as this is my strength, this is my call from God, and if I go in with a mind to get it done and a mind to re- retain my dignity in the middle of it, I will succeed and I will accomplish this task with grace. So something I um, realized, okay, so many of you know, I, I just told you my, I've had three, I have three babies. First one, I got an epidural. It was rough. You know, I was put in shock over the amount of pain that a woman goes through. Um, and then baby number two, because I had such bad side effects uh, from the epidural on baby number one, baby number two, I made up my mind. I'm just going to do this. Um, and uh, I prayed. God answered my prayer, gave me a four hour labor and delivery. Uh, lots of story around that. But um, I was able to go through with it without any medication at all. Um, and but it wasn't pretty. It I, you know, I would love to say I handled it like a champ, but there were some tears involved. Uh, it got a little loud at times. Right. Um, and I didn't think I could do it a lot, um, but I did it. And so by the time baby number three came, I went into that delivery room. First of all, I didn't even show up to the hospital until I was like seven centimeters and so close. Uh, But I was able to retain my dignity because I knew what to expect. I knew uh, this is going to hurt. This is going to be the worst pain of my life. Uh, But I don't have to lose control of myself. I don't have to... um, act like a fool in this pain, right? Because this is what I'm called to do. And if I just grin and bear it, I'm going to get this job done and I'm going to have a dignity at the end of this, right? And I think my generation, including myself, has been so indoctrinated with, if you have pain, if you have something that's really hard, take a pill. If you have something that is complicated and hard to deal with, it's someone else's fault and someone has to get me out of this. But that is not the mindset of this Bible, this, this scripture, because it says she rises well at sea at night in the middle of adversity, in the middle of, it says a twisting of the light. If you go back down to the root word, it goes down to a, uh, winding staircase, um, have you ever felt like you just, you're just going around in circles that you just feel like, you know, you know, a mother's perspective. All I ever do all day long is change diapers, do the laundry, wash the dishes, clean up the same 50 toys 50 times a day. Right. Um, but even in the middle of that, a woman of virtue, according to the Bible rises, she gets up. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but get up, do something. You know what I believe? I believe with all of my heart spared me from going deep into the pits of postpartum depression with my first baby. And it was what I thought at the time was an unfortunate fact. Um, what I believed at the time was an unfortunate fact was uh, that she was born the first day of a tent revival in Parkersburg, West Virginia. And something that that demanded me to do was at at around five or six o'clock at night, I would have to rise up, get up, get dressed, fix my hair, uh, get my baby ready, And go into church. Now I know what you're thinking. I I should have. I should have been easier on myself. But I pushed myself. And I believe. It saved me from going down into a pit of postpartum depression. Because I got up. 
and I did something. Not only did something, but I went to church. I went to that very place that had the ability to nourish my spirit and lift up my head and give me the encouragement to make another day. Something that I have come to grips with and realized in the last little while is when I accept my duties as a wife and as a mother, no matter how small or trivial trivial that they look, uh, there's been days, don't you ever just wake up sad? Don't you ever just wake up just in a battle? And it used to be on those days, I would laze around and I would feel sorry for myself and I'd just complain. But you know what I figured out? If I would rise up, get up, wash my face, get dressed, fix my hair, get ready for the day and do something. Somebody said, well, I really don't want to get dressed to do laundry. If that's not what makes you feel better, you know, that's, that's you. But simply fulfilling your purpose, no matter how small it looks, is better than any medicine this world has to offer us. Okay. So uh, if you feel like you're going through the motions, if you feel like you are just in a dark place, rise up because it's in that place of fulfillment of purpose that we see that we are accomplishing the task of a virtuous woman because in that place we not only rise up and do the work but we feed our families a mother is the glue that holds the family together that's a strength she holds up all the little pieces the husband holds up the family but the wife keeps us all together okay and so uh, uh, p- part of that is uh, not only feeding our family but it says she giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens the young women coming up behind us don't be so stuck in your bubble of family that you forget that there is a ministry for you aside from family. And I'm not just talking about not everybody has a microphone in their hand. Not everybody has an evangelistic ministry. And I realize that. But you, I, I'm talking, okay, I'm talking to my generation for just a minute. I, I think of the scripture so many times. Um, you you um, have a need of men teach you when you should be teachers yourself. Okay, if you are my generation, it's time for you to woman up. And I know this sounds pretty hard, but it's time for you to put your big girl skirt or pants on and make a decision. I'm not the baby anymore. It's time for me to take care of my family, take care, do the work that I'm supposed to do right now. And also, it's not all about me. It's time for me to invest in someone younger than me and decide it's not all about me. Okay. Okay. There are so many young women right now who have been so indoctrinated with the mindset of feminism, with the mindset of this ungodly and perverse generation that there aren't any women in my generation who have stood up and decided I'm going to disciple somebody because they're so, they feel like they are so entitled to pity. This is your job. Take care of your families, have a relationship with Jesus and invest with somebody else. Okay. I said it. I said it. I did it. I, it, okay. I'm sorry if you don't want to be my friend anymore, but this is the Bible. This is the mindset of the Bible. Be strong. You remember, you remember when God spoke to Daniel and, 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 and Daniel fell flat on his face and he said he felt like he couldn't even breathe. God said, stand up, Daniel, stand up like a man. And Daniel would get up and Daniel would say, Lord, I have no strength. I'm not strong enough. At one point he said, I don't feel like I can breathe. The breath is taken out of me. God said, stand up, Daniel. Stand up. I have a word from you. And when he did that, the Lord touched him. He said he felt a hand. The Lord touched him. All right. You might feel like you are not strong enough. But that is a lie from the enemy. God has given you something to strengthen you. He has touched you. Even if you feel like it's the the tiniest little touch in church or, or in your Bible study, in your personal time with God, you through the power of the Holy Ghost are strong enough to fulfill your purpose. And on the days when you feel like you just cannot do it, rise up, get 
up. Don't waller in that pit. There's my inner voice, Virginia, coming. Don't wallow in that pit. Don't get down in the mud and stay dirty. Get up, wash yourself off, fulfill your purpose, because that's what you, as a woman of God, is supposed to do. And here's a commandment. Proverbs 31, 27 says, this virtuous woman, she looketh well to the ways of her household. Strive to do what God has called you to do with excellence. She does it well. She looketh ways to the uh, well to the ways of her household. All right. And eateth not the bread of idleness. All right. Here we go. Y'all ready? Don't be a lazy parent. Ouch. How many times have we said, I'm just going to do this because it's easier. Easier does not mean better. And this is, oh, Katie, quit talking because this is up my alley. I am in my, I'm in my driveway and I am quite literally in my driveway right now, but I am in my territory because I'm, I, I, here, here's what I've said in the past. I'm too busy. I'm too stressed. This is just too much. I'm just going to do what's easiest. Well, what's easiest is not always the best option. Okay. What's hardest is not always the best option. Finding a middle ground is normally the best option. And let me just speak at something right now that is so popular right now in 2024. And that is this mom culture of self-care, me time. Uh, You know how many women I hear right now saying, uh, I'm not having any more kids because it's time to focus on me. At what point in the Bible does Jesus teach us that we're, our life is supposed to be totally focused on ourselves, that we're supposed to invest in ourselves? I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing that as the, the, the part of the Bible. Now, am I saying that you're never supposed to do anything that um, improves your health? No. It, I'm on keto right now. Girl, got to lose some weight, right? Uh, you know, and 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 I, I understand. I, I am, uh, you have heard me say before, I'm more of an introvert. So, um, you know, a lot of people would say I need me time. Well, I very rarely have me time, but I have what I call God time in the mornings. I set my alarm every morning to make sure that I get up before my kids because I need a few minutes to wake up because I know how it is as a mom. Uh, They wake you up in a whirlwind. And that is not, uh, would conducive be the right word to my mindset? I need to wake up kind of slow. I walk into wherever I am, uh, fix me a cup of coffee, um, sit down, read my Bible, slow morning, but I'm spending time with God. It's also, I'm still fulfilling a purpose, fulfilling a crucial part of being a mom, being a woman of God, being a Christian, uh, because if I don't put my relationship with God, not my self, but my relationship with God first, my family will suffer. And if I, if I'm not, uh, striving to be the best, uh, Christian child of God that I can be right now, I will not be a good mom. Okay. So there is, there is a small, um, sliver of truth in the me time movement. Um, but it's a little bit twisted. It's a little bit off course, in my opinion, um, because God has not called us to be selfish. God has not called us to be lazy, but God has called us to be purpose driven, uh, 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 fulfilling women and men of God that are not stuck in the mud and can't find a way out. Okay. So if I am looking way well to the ways of my household, I am, I am looking and, and, and striving to, uh, direct my family, my children in a way of excellence. And that demands me to find my strengths, not be in competition with my husband and decide he should be doing this. He should be doing that. But simply acknowledging my strengths, acknowledging his strengths and doing that. 
uh, utilizing those strengths because the feminism movement, you know what they have done? They have uh, done the opposite of empowerment. They have depowered women into believing that they should act like men. When girl, you are called to be a woman. You are called to be a purpose driven woman of God, looking well to the ways of her household, rising in the middle of adversity, rising when you feel like you're going through the emotions, rising when you feel like you don't have anything else to give. You get up, get up, Daniel. God has given you a strength to be able to fulfill this purpose in your life. Stand up like a woman. Get up. Fulfill your purpose with dignity. Don't give in to the mindset of, I have to medicate this. Don't give in to the mindset of the world that if I feel any type of hardship at all, I have to uh, 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 take some sort of, of medical diagnosis that needs to be treated like a disease. Get up. Get dressed. And um, see the purpose in what you're doing. Fulfill the purpose of your life. And, you know, it may not work day one. But you know what I found? That in purpose and fulfilling purpose in your life and fulfilling that, you know, and it, I know, I know how it is. It feels so meaningless to clean your house. But you know what you find? A clean house makes you feel better. Looking at empty laundry hampers makes you feel better. When you look in the mirror and don't you see yourself in pajamas and wreck of a head hair, it makes you feel better. When you when you do something to relieve the stress of your husband and you see that his load's a little lighter, it makes you feel better. When you see the joy on your children's face whenever you uh, make something that makes their life easier, It makes you feel better. Everybody wants you to believe that fulfilling selfish desires will make you feel better. But that's simply not the truth. That's not the biblical perspective of a woman. And I I don't want to be like everybody else. I don't want to be like the world and medicate my troubles away. Obviously, it's not working. Everybody, our, our, our generation is the generation of psychology. I, I heard somebody say the other day, Elijah preached on it, that, um, you know, our generation is the most um, diagnosed um, and we're, you know, the woke generation that they are the most uh, psychological people, right? That they have diagnosed and uh, seen problems and diagnosed depression and and um, postpartum depression and um, you know ADHD all of these things we are the most diagnosed generation and we are the most medicated generation which according to all of them to the psychologists in the medical field of the world we should be the best and yet we are the most suicidal, depressed, psychotic generation that has ever walked the world. What does that tell you? It does not work. Medication does not work. And, you know, I think that's probably a different, a different uh, discussion for a different day. But I dare you, don't be part of this mindset of I'm going to medicate my troubles away and never face what I'm supposed to do and fulfill my purpose in life. Get up. Get up, Daniel. Get up, woman of God. Man of God. Do what you're called to do and you will find that fulfilling your purpose does not have suicidal uh, side effects. It does not have um, side effects that will be detrimental to your health to your life and to your family but fulfilling your purpose and proudly being a feminine woman that washes the dishes and raises her kids and supports her husband and everything that he does will give you a happier life it will fulfill your purpose be a virtuous woman i love you guys i hope you're not mad at me if you like this video be sure to comment 
tell me if you still love me subscribe to this channel and um tell your friends about it all right see you guys.